This is a test. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. So the question is, if I put the mic, if I'm not hand-holding, can you hear this? Can you hear that as well? Not so well. I hear, I hear some head shaking. Right. Yes. Yes, please do an introduction here. Let me hand. Interesting. It's going to take more coordination than I've got. I, uh, I think you'll be fine. So, and you, you want to use this? Yeah. and see if anybody else comes. So we might as well get started here. Uh, good evening, and on behalf of Lewis University and the History Department, I welcome you to the spring uh, James and Mary Claire's Pontiac Endowed Lecture Series. Uh, we had intended to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage back in 2020, but we were otherwise uh, hibernating due to the um, pandemic. Uh, so it's good to be back, and thank you all for being with us tonight. Um, special welcome to, of course, all our Lewis University uh, students. Uh, and we also have Romeoville High School students here, and I want you to all know that there are uh, lanyards in the back that you can grab and take with you. There are some um, folders on the uh, history program because we're the coolest subject at Lewis. So, uh, <laughs> so they're in the back and um, please help yourself. So our guest speaker this evening is Dr. Elizabeth Griffith. She received her PhD from the American University in Washington, DC, pioneering the field of women's history. She received the Woodrow Wilson grant for research in women's studies in 1978 which then supported her efforts to publish her first book in her own right, The Life of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Dr. Griffith's scholarship has also been informed by a lifetime of activism. She was an early participant in the Berkshire Women's History Conferences. She volunteered with the National Women's Political Caucus, and she has marched for the Equal Rights Amendment. In addition, Dr. Griffith has been a Kennedy Fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics as well as a Klingenstein Fellow at Columbia Teachers College, and she lectures for the Smithsonian Associates. Dr. Griffith has also pioneered women's history courses in high school. Her talk tonight is based on her most recent book, Formidable, Women and the Fight for Equality, 1920 to 2020. She will focus on black and white women. So we are on the cusp of Black History Month as well as Women's History Month. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Griffith. 
addition to teaching at um, American University and at Harvard, I was for 22 years a high school principal, which is why I've been so bossy about asking you to move up and I'm moving the podium toward you. Um, if these pews were movable, I would move them so we could be closer. <laughs> Gloria Steinem never stood behind a podium. She thought it was a barrier, so she was always out here. But I can't look at my notes, click the clicker, look at you, and hold the mic all at the same time. This is a challenge to my uncoordinated skills. I am thankful for the invitation and the opportunity. I'm delighted to be visiting Lewis University and learning more about it. And I'm particularly um, honored to be part of this lecture series. Jim Sispaniak was a, um, a public school social studies teacher for 33 years. My mom was a public school social studies teacher for probably 40 years. Um, and the smartest woman I knew. She provided book reviews at breakfast and word games at lunch. Uh, and I was learning all the time. And that's what a good teacher does. A good teacher so ignites your curiosity that you just are captured by the stories, which is why history is such a good field, stories. Um, he was inspired by this university, um, by classes with Father Brennan, um, to change the world for the better by being a teacher. This was reinforced by his family's ethic of service. And so with his second wife, Fran, he created scholarships and this lecture program at the university. Um, and I want to make a mention about Catholic education in America. Catholic teachers inspired generations of Americans, many of whom arrived as poor immigrants escaping dire circumstances. They were faithful, illiterate victims of discrimination in this country. Paddy wagons got their name because so many Irish were being thrown into jail in New York City and in Boston. Frequently, they were met at the boat by recruiters, either for factories or for during the Civil War for the Army. I know that there's a course being offered, or there are, there's, um, courses have been taught here about Irish women in America and how they played a role as, um, uh, throughout our history, but as labor organizers, as troublemakers, as nurses, as teachers, as nuns, um, because a lot of history we now know, we were not necessarily taught this for most of our, most of the period covered by American history did not teach an American history that was bottom up as well as top down. And so we're learning a lot more. Those Irish immigrants who were the first wave of Catholics into this country, in addition to doing all those jobs, built the Transcontinental Railroad from the east to the west. And it was Asian immigrants who built it from the west to the east. And both of those enormous contributions to the growth of our country were met with feral discrimination. Catholic schools taught civics and catechism. And the women who were, in my case, those teachers, the nuns, who were either um, nurses or teachers, those were professionals in an era when many women did not have a professional role. The nuns um, who taught me were the first uh, women I knew with advanced degrees in addition to my mother. I know that um, St. John the Baptist de La Salle has said, that to teach the hearts of your students is the greatest miracle you can perform. And I'm confident that happens here every day. I'm honored to be honoring um, Teacher Jim and his family. So, I'm talking about women. I'm talking about formidable women. My book is about American history and those women who were change agents who advanced equal and civil rights in the 100 years after women got the vote in 1920. It acknowledges generations of black women who were frequently left out of the Chronicle, as well as a diverse cast of all kinds of other women, including women who opposed um, the rights that others were seeking. A very prominent cohort of these positive change agents, of these progressive change agents, were Jewish women, part of whose faith tradition was to give back to the community beyond their own religion. I chose the title because formidable is a wonderfully flexible word. It means um, that 
that you're challenged, that you're daunted. And the, the men who thought their lives were going to change if you made any advances for women were taunted, pretty much terrified by what could happen by all these changes. And formidable means a huge challenge. And for the women who were trying to advance rights, it was an enormous challenge. They were met by opposition everywhere. And then the women who succeeded were just formidable. They were gutsy and redoubtable. And um, particularly uh, among black women, they demonstrated enormous moral and physical courage. Um, really hard to conceive how brave they had to be. The book begins with the certification of the 19th Amendment, August uh, 26, 1920. At in that time, it was certified by the Secretary of State. Now it's the Archivist of the United States. This was an era of enormous racial violence. There had been a peak um, beginning in 1917 with the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan and the Birth of a Nation movie. Um, and the, the Great War had created such social disruption that um, people were unsettled and they needed to beat up on somebody, so they beat up on a lot of people, but principally were lynching blacks. Um, the book ends with the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett in October of 2020, a week before the election. I was saying at dinner that my agent and my publishers are all young people, probably under 35, and they thought that was a depressing ending. That if I'm writing about the history of women and change in America and I'm ending with the change in the Supreme Court, that might not be uplifting. Um, so the book uh, continues into the uh, January 2021 inauguration, which if you recall, um, there were people wearing white, there were people wearing purple, which were the suffrage colors. President Biden's inaugural address made reference to the suffrage marchers in 1913, and then it ends with the uplifting poem by Amanda Gorman. Um, I'm proud to say that the paperback is almost sold out, so they brought, uh, the hardback is almost sold out, so they brought out a paperback, and the paperback ends more depressingly because I was able to add five paragraphs about the Dobbs decision. But this is only to demonstrate that the arc of justice for women and for blacks and for about anybody who's not white male in this country has been jagged. The progress uh, does not advance in a linear manner. But because it's a book about women, it's also got a lot of social history in it. It's got artists and athletes, it's got poets and performers, it's got fashion and underwear, and it's got bathing beauties, and it's got Barbies. Because frankly, Barbie has run for president more in American history than any other woman. <laughs> she wins, she even had a female vice president, and her inaugural gowns are covered with sequins. <laughs> so they won. Um, it was huge. People thought the world would change, and it didn't. But this was a fight that had taken more than 100 years. This was a fight that took three generations of leadership. This was not, the vote was not given to women. They fought tooth and nail to earn it, and almost didn't get it. Um, this is the language of the 19th Amendment. You will note that all this does is says, in all the ways you can discriminate against allowing people to vote, you can no longer discriminate on account of sex. It says nothing about women. The word woman does not appear in the United States Constitution. So, Secretary of Colby, Secretary of State, a diplomat, did not invite either of these women to the signing. These two women are credited with being the leadership women who pushed suffrage over the finish line. That's more true of Carrie Chapman Catt than it is of Alice Paul. Carrie Chapman Catt was a brilliant political strategist, and from 1915 to 1920, she was running a two-tier campaign, a state-level campaign, because if women got the vote in the states, then they were voting for members of Congress who would vote for suffrage in the Congress. But there were still lots of states that hadn't enfranchised women, so she's also lobbying at the congressional level. She's trying to woo Woodrow Wilson, who opposed suffrage for six of the eight years that he was in office. She's she, is, she has created a multiracial, multi-ethnic, national coalition that pushes it over the finish line um, at the very end. Alice Paul is the person. Alice Paul's, the, so the first generation, I mentioned three generations. The first generation, Stanton, Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, Lucy Stone, 
it's the four mothers who are all dead. Um, they recruited Carrie Chapman Catt and the, and the middle generation, and Alice Paul recruited herself from the British suffrage movement. She'd been an American graduate student studying in England and had learned these outdoor tactics. So she suggests they have a parade on the day before Wilson's inauguration, the first time women had marched, on Pens had marched any place in Washington. It was a first. Um, if you know Washington, they started at the foot of Capitol Hill. They got four blocks and then a bunch of drunken men, truly a huge mob of drunken men, who were there to celebrate the inauguration stopped the parade. They had to um, call on the, cal the cavalry to come in from Fort Myer to, clean Pen to clear Pennsylvania Avenue so these women, who by now were ragged and beat up, um, finally got to where, um, to the end of the parade, which had intended to be this pageant on the steps of the Treasury Department. In addition to Columbia, there was liberty, there was freedom, there, all those little, there were 100 little kids dancing around. But this is March 3rd, 1913, it's freezing. So these people didn't hang around for the parade to come. Um, so the, the whole thing um, ends up in a mess, but it ends up in a mess on the front page of every newspaper in America which puts the idea of having a federal suffrage amendment makes it a national issue, which it really had not been. Um, it was sort of a quieter fight than that. Um, Paul is also the person who organizes the first pickets of the, no one had ever picketed the White House before suffragists from January 1917 to November. Um, these women were, uh, they always, they were very polite, they were very quiet, they had six at each of the Pennsylvania Avenue gates of the White House until the war breaks out. They didn't anticipate there was gonna be the Great War, and once it breaks out, they get nastier with their signs, they're a little snarky. Kaiser Wilson, what are you gonna do for women while you're fighting for democracy abroad? And so, the rioters attack the women, and the women get arrested for disturbing the peace. And then they're thrown in jail for eight weeks, three months, they go on strike, they're force fed, their conditions were horrible, and again, headlines. Alice Paul never actually changed a vote. There is no record that anybody changed their vote because of Alice Paul, but she changes the atmosphere. She changes the conversation. Suffrage also won, it mostly wins because of Cat, but it wins, Paul is contributing to the PR campaign. And then it wins because we were in a war and women were demonstrating that indeed they could be citizens. They could work in factories and fields at home, filling in for men, they could go abroad. That's um, the women who were the telephone operators in the trenches. America had the 19th smallest military in um, 1917. It was smaller than Portugal, but we had American technology and that was the telephone. And so, um, military leaders could communicate at the front lines through the telephone, and they tried to recruit men to do this job, but the men did not have nimble fingers or appropriate language skills, so the women took over. Um, this, is the vote, this is the map of where women were voting. The fact that women were already voting was really important. They were voting in 19 states. They probably represented um, six million uh, voters. This was important. So the purple, they, have, they get to vote for anybody. The yellow, they only get to vote for president. The orange, they only get to vote in primaries. And the brown will oppose not only suffrage, but lots of other things. That's, that same vote, well, from Tennessee down, um, Kentucky down, that's, that's who will oppose the Equal Rights Amendment um, much later as well. But the final reason suffrage voted suffrage passed was because of Harry Byrne. Harry Byrne is 24 years old, he's a Republican, he's from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, you need two thirds of the House and the Senate and three quarters of the state to add of the, all the states to um, uh, amend the Constitution. And they had 35 states, they needed 36 and they couldn't figure out where they were gonna get the 36th. Because the states, lots of those brown states were either Southern and opposed to women's suffrage because it would increase the black vote, or they're Republican controlled and conservative Republicans related to manufacturing did not want women voting because they thought they would argue about improving factory conditions. Um, 
But the governor of Tennessee is a Democrat, and this is a presidential year. This is August of 1920, and the Democrats don't want to be blamed for opposing suffrage, even though they've done a really good job of doing that for most of the Wilson administration. So they strong arm the governor of Tennessee, who will subsequently lose his reelection campaign, and everybody goes to Tennessee to make the fight. Among the people who oppose suffrage, we've talked about the manufacturers, we talked about Southern segregationists, but were the liquor interest because of women's interest in temperance. Temperance is prohibition, not drinking. If you are a woman without any rights to child custody, your income, your inheritance, your clothing, or your children, you were very vulnerable if the person you depended on drank a lot. Um, so the saloon keepers and the liquor manufacturers were right that women might be interested in curbing their behavior. Um, so, Carrie, so Carrie Chapman Catt goes to Tennessee um, and writes that the entire legislature is drunk. They're reeling around because the liquor industry is keeping a 24-hour hospitality suite. The Senate sobers up enough to pass. They have 35 and a half states. Will they get the legislature? And their whip count suggests that they're going to lose, that they don't have the votes. The antis move to table. It ties in parliamentary procedure. If um, there's a vote to tie on an action to table, you have to have an immediate vote. Harry Byrne's name was the seventh in the alphabet, and he changed his vote from no to yes. So the single vote by a 24-year-old guy got suffrage after a 100-year fight by a bunch of women. No woman voted for suffrage. Only white men voted for suffrage. And without Harry, it would have started all over again. So while hell breaks loose, they say that he escaped out a window and across a ledge and into the attic and everybody was yelling at him. We're not sure that's true. And the next day, he holds a press conference and he pulls out of his pocket this letter from his mother who has said, please support Mrs. Cat. Please bring me some new sheet music for the piano when you come home, but vote for suffrage. Be a good boy. And Harry says to the accumulated press, a boy knows he should always do what his mother tells him to do. I have a six foot five inch son, I tell him that all the time. <laughs> so they won. But it was an incomplete victory. The 19th Amendment covered white and black women. Sometimes people think that it did not cover black women because it did not protect the right of black women to vote in places where they were so discriminated against. But they were legally eligible to vote. But Native Americans, Asian immigrants, people living in territories of the District of Columbia where you still cannot vote, women married to foreigners could not vote. Native Americans fixed that pretty soon, or began to fix it, under the leadership of these two women who in 1924 passed the Native American Citizenship Act. Just reflect on that title, the Native American Citizenship Act. So what were they before we got here? Um, but the federal government can grant citizenship. The federal government does not control state voting laws, as we are very aware in current times. So states in um, New England, the upper Midwest, um, from Montana south into Arizona and um, New Mexico uh, constrained Native American voting until there were lots of lawsuits after the Second World War, really until 1962. And we know now again they're being restrained over issues of addresses and other things. Native American men demanded the right to vote when they came back from the Second World War because did you know in our American military, the population which is most highly represented are Native American men by percentage. Um, the, oops, am I doing this upside down? Hold on, there. Um, remember we talked about the Asians building the railroad from um, west to east because they were brilliant at dynamite? But the, but the influx of Asians created such resistance, they ate different things, they spoke different things, they had braids, um, that uh, they were viewed as work competition. So um, exclusion acts began. We didn't, Asian Americans did not get voting rights until 1943 when we were allied with China to win the Second World War. And then in the 50s, other Asian populations were admitted. 
and eventually, other than territories in the District of Columbia, um, most, most groups have rights, rights to be citizens to vote if they can qualify under the state laws that are passed about who gets to vote. Opponents of suffrage worried that women would change everything, um, and they didn't change very much. For all the terror, um, they did not immediately have impact, took a long time. One thing that changed immediately was where women voted. Prior to 1920, men voted in saloons where you could drink and smit, spit and smoke and swear and have a jolly time with all your cronies, but that, of course, would not be appropriate for ladies. So um, voting booths were moved to libraries and to schools and to fire stations, and none of that uh, coarse behavior was allowed. The Girl Scouts of America volunteered um, to be outside every polling booth so that they would babysit while you went in to um, vote because one of the arguments against women voting was that it would take them away from their domestic responsibilities. Um, but women do not turn out. In 1920, America has doubled the size of the electorate, more than doubled because there were more women than men, more than doubled the size of the electorate, and turnout is the lowest it's been since 1820, and in 1820, only property-owning white men could vote. Nobody can figure this out, um, and there's not enough data, because even though this was a whole new phenomenon, nobody thought about counting. We know, you all know after any election when you're watching the returns, we know who everybody voted. We know by age group, we know by, um, race, we know by gender, we know, by ev we know everything about voters because exit polls have been conducted. Nobody started doing exit polls until the 1980s. Nobody started counting women even as sort of a movement until 1948. So there's a lot of speculation about for whom and whether women voted. And I'm applying all of this to white women. Black women were very eager to vote and were supported by their communities. White women had been told all these things during the suffrage campaign about staying home with the kids and that they, the political arena was dirty and messy and they shouldn't engage and um, was just not appropriate. It would undermine their husband's authority. They had all these reasons for why women shouldn't vote. Black communities said, of course, we all need to vote. We have things to do. We have causes. We need to protect the beloved community. So they were eager to vote, but they were closed out um, in most of the places where, in 1920, black women and men were living. Since 19, so since 1984, more women have voted in every presidential and midterm election than men. Women vote. Um, they don't all vote for the people I wish they were voting for, but they vote, they turn out. And black women, who were barred from voting primarily by white Democrats in the 1920s are now the backbone of the Democratic Party and usually responsible for Democrat Party successes. Black and white women had different agendas. So the people who support, not everybody supported suffrage. The, I mean, it, when you think that they've created this whole social movement and, and changed the Constitution, you think it must be lots of people. It's really a pretty small minority of people compared to the entire population which is why all those women weren't voting, because they hadn't been converted. But people who were suffragists had a reason that they wanted the vote. They wanted to fix factory conditions. They wanted to end, they wanted to close saloons. They wanted to, um, um, they had a cause. Um, and once they got the vote, once they'd come in coalition to get the vote, then they splintered into their individual silos and causes. White women, wanted to elect women. White women wanted what white men had. They wanted to be political players. They wanted to be elected officials. They had a progressive legislative agenda they wanted to pass. Some of them, pretty small minority, wanted to pass an Equal Rights Amendment. And probably a bigger group than the Equal Rights Amendment wanted to have, um, wanted to have access to birth control, but that was not a political action that they could take. Black women had a much broader agenda because it was a community agenda. They were saving lives. They needed to end lynching. They needed to end racial violence. They needed to end Jim Crow legal segregation. And then they needed to rescue these under-resourced communities with no water, no sewage, no schools. They had a big deal to do. Um, so let's talk about white women first. So they ran for office. Um, not some women ran for office. Uh, only 11 were elected. 
eight of them um, were related to somebody, so they generally either got appointed to fill a term or ran for a term, but they almost always only served one term. They didn't linger. Three women without family ties stayed longer and had more impact, and two of them um, you should know about. Mary Norton, a Democrat of, of, um, from New Jersey, stays 26 years, will rise to be chair of the Labor Committee in the House, and she gets the Fair Labor Standards Act through um, during the 1930s. And Edith North Rogers, who serves even longer, serves on the Armed Services Committee during the Second World War, and she's the one who creates the WACS, the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, and after about a year, they got rid of auxiliary because these women were so essential. And under the wax, the first black female battalion of women, the 8666, um, go to Europe to serve in England and France, sorting the mail. Because the mail was not getting through, and if the mail didn't get through, morale went down. And they did a job that no man had been able to do in three months. They cleared out two years of mail. Uh, and then had an experience um, in, um, you know, a broader experience than in America, as black soldiers had as well. Um, those women are now centurions, and the few remaining are, um, there's, a, there's a bill, they have voted to name them, to give them the Congressional Honor Award, which is the highest award that the Congress can give, and they are casting a medal and um, the survivors and all of their family members will get it. I'm introducing you to Adelina Otero Warren because she is the first Hispanic woman we know who ran for the Congress. She ran in 1922, she lost. Um, she had been the head of a school board in Albuquerque. She'd uh, had several statewide offices, but she decided, um, she'd also been married, um, but was divorced. She decided since she was then in a lesbian relationship that moving to Washington would not be an easy thing to do, so she and her partner became ranchers and she dropped out of politics. But she's going to be on the new 25 cent coin. I'm introducing you to Rebecca Felton, who sort of represents the range of suffrage support. She is technically the first woman to serve in the Senate. In 1922, she served for 24 hours. She was what's known as a seat warmer. The governor of Georgia appointed her because he was seeking other women's votes for his own election. She was the most prominent woman in Georgia. She um, had been a suffragist in favor of white-only suffrage. She was pro-lynching, she was anti-Semitic, um, and she was technically the last member of Congress to have to have owned enslaved workers. And I say technically, she's born in 1835, married a plantation owner, had authority over enslaved workers, but because she's a woman, she owns nothing. So she has power, but couldn't like will them or heir them to anybody. Um, the, there will be, um, there aren't very many senators. She almost didn't serve. People wrote to Harding and said, please call a session, call a session so we can have a woman who's been in the Senate. And he resisted until he needed a Navy appro appropriations bill. And then um, she got to serve for, got to, got voted in, gave a speech, said, voted for the bill, gave a speech and said, um, I may be making you uncomfortable, but more women will come and they will contribute. And the last act of the Senate before adjourning was paying her travel expenses. So this was the legislative agenda. This was passed by eight um, very progressive white women's groups, but even more progressive white women's groups objected because while it did have prevention of lynching, it did not have protection of black women voting. And black women had petitioned white women's groups to say, come to the Congress with us, let's try to pass something. There were protections of black voters after the Civil Rights Amendments until they withdrew federal troops from the South. There's a period where black voting was protected, never since. Um, but they wouldn't do it. They said it was a race issue, not a women's issue. Uh, and, and so this was their list, and their priority was infant and maternal health. In 1920, the United States was 20th out of the 20 nations measured and having the worst death rate um, for new mothers and infants. Today, the United States is 78th. We have gone down. The list is longer, but our, the rate of infant and uh, maternal death has increased because of racial disparities in healthcare in this country. Um, 
But so, so they, they, they managed to pass what's called the Shepherd Towner Act, 1921. And then when women, because men are worried that women are gonna vote. And if they don't vote for the Shepherd Towner Act, they're gonna lose their seats. But then women didn't vote in 1922, and they didn't vote in 1924. So they defunded the bill. And when women didn't vote in 1926, they repealed the bill. Alice Paul drafted the Equal Rights Amendment. This was unpopular then because Paul, having learned suffrage in England, had a parliamentary point of view. She believed you held one party responsible. So she was always blaming the Democrats for everything. So she had only Republicans introduce the Equal Rights Amendment. The idea of bipartisan support for anything was not in Alice Paul's mindset. Kat called her stupendously stupid for that outlook. Um, uh, so, and it was also um, progressives thought that the Equal Rights Amendment would hurt women in an era where there were very few factory protections, there were, that there were many women who needed protective labor legislation. That would eventually change in the 60s, and that's one of the reasons that the Equal Rights Amendment finally passed, because labor unions stopped opposing it. This is Margaret Sanger, just to point out that this is an important part of 1920s history. In 1920, there were three legal birth control clinics in America. In 1930, there are 300. Some of them are staffed are in African-American communities and staffed by African-American professionals, but they are almost all urban. Um, so they are not solving everybody's problems. Um, Sanger supported birth control because she wanted to end abortion. She thought if um, you could prevent pregnancy, then you wouldn't have to deal with women's self-inducing abortion. So that by the 1930s, white women are pretty discouraged because um, they thought the 19th Amendment was just going to open every door for them, and it did not. Um, and so they, they slip back. Um, they go back sort of into volunteering and political parties. They're having to start at the ground, root, the, the, at the ground level again. Um, white women's organizations are not propelling change in the 1930s. The war propels change in the 1940s. Not a whole lot is happening in the 1950s. It won't be until the 1960s that white women's organizations and feminist movement are revived. Meanwhile, it's the 1920s. And the 1920s, the elements of social change, sometimes just social behavior, has more impact on women's lives than a legislative change. The fact that women were no longer wearing corsets that their skirts were shorter, that they could move, that they could play sports, that they could go into a bar. They had been prohib prohibited from bars. Now you could go drink with a boy. Um, lots of, um, the Model T allowed for lots of unsupervised backseat sex. Um, and the Harlem Renaissance, jazz, uh, uh, Josephine Baker, there are black icons, there's black culture also thriving because of um, the Great Migration, which is gonna show in a minute. Um, but this, the 20s is also a hotbed of Klan activity. The Klan, I hope you all know, is not just centered in the South. In the 20s and 30s, it is a national organization. It's electing governors and senators in the upper Midwest, in the far West. Um, one of uh, FDR's appointees to the Supreme Court, Hugo Black, member of the Klan, didn't keep him from being confirmed immediately. But because of these threats, um, the threats, the, the conditions in the South fuel the Great Migration, which began during the Great War uh, as people were recruiting people to work in war industries. But as blacks move into major cities, this has huge demographic change. They are still discriminated against, but they are discriminated in a different way. They may have the lowest job, but it's a better paid lowest job than it was in the South. They have access to public education, they're creating newspapers, they're creating political organizations, they're beginning to elect aldermen, and if they are represented by whites, which they were into the 30s and 40s, those white members of Congress recognize that they have black constituents. So most of the anti-lynching bills in, um, introduced in the 1920s were introduced by white members of Congress who represented black districts, and they usually passed in the House, and then they were filibustered by the totally Southern Senate, or the Southern-dominated Senate. So black women who had this broader agenda are working behind the scenes. 
They're working out of church basements because it's safe. They are lady deacons. They are agricultural agents. They are public health nurses. They are teachers. They are working throughout their community trying to um, encourage people to learn to read and write. If they're literate, then they're training them how to go to register, how to answer the questions, how to memorize the preamble to the Alabama Constitution, how to do whatever they can. But everything they do is dangerous. Everything they do risks not only their life, their husband's life, their employment, their rent. Um, so these are women working behind the scenes. Many of them will begin to join the NAACP in secret, because it was illegal, in southern states. But these, these are, this is the force of the black community that will have power. Now, because none of us have yet had the advantage of taking an advanced placement black history course, we're going to have a quick run through here um, um, of um, notable race women. I hope you know all these names. I have a PhD in American history, and I did not know all these names, or I didn't know much beyond the name. Um, so I hope, um, I hope one of the contributions of my book is to introduce these people to a wider um, list. So these are the icons. Mary Church Terrell and um, Ida B. Wells are powerful women from the 1890s on, and um, um, Terrell will live into the 1950s, but um, they're, they're, they're the four, I'm going to call them the four mother crowd, and they are not the only ones. There are, there are many, but these are the ones who would have been best known in the, in the wider public. They both grew up in Memphis. Um, both, both of these women were born into slavery. Terrell has two white grandfathers who impregnated enslaved women and then let the products of those pregnancies marry, and she was born in her grandfather's home. Then emancipation comes, and because her father has been a sort of um, treated better, has education, he will become a black businessman, a land developer, a real estate mogul, and uh, considered the wealthiest black man in the South. He sends his only daughter, Molly, to Oberlin. She earns, um, where in her Oberlin class of, I think it's 1875, there are three black women. Um, she earns an undergraduate or graduate degree. She speaks five languages. She tours in Europe. She is very light-skinned and very wealthy, and she marries a man who's gone to Harvard and Howard Law School. Teddy Roosevelt will name him a judge, a black man, and then Taft will name him a higher-level judge. In both of those positions, he was the first black man to hold those positions. Terrell and her family represent W.E.B. Du Bois' talented tenth. This is the elite. Um, she marches. Both of these women march in 1913. Um, she will actually march. Well, it's, we know that Wells marched with white women. The suffragists tried to put all the blacks at the back of the line. Um, and we're not sure whether Terrell marched with the new, Howard had just opened a new black sorority. And they were supposed to be marching in the back, but they put on their academic regalia and they probably marched with the college women closer up. Um, Ida B. Wells um, is an investigative journalist who um, challenges lynching, and she travels around to places where lynchings are, and she documents that the lynching had nothing to do with any black man whistling at a white woman, that it was the black man who had opened a grocery store or a livery service and was presenting economic competition, so let's lynch him. She publishes in, in 1892 something called Southern Horrors, and it's the beginning of the counting um, that is continuing now and the equal justice activity in um, Montgomery. Um, Mary Church Terrell pickets the White House in 1917, and in 1951, she's still picketing downtown Washington um, segregated restaurants. And you see her, and she's this little old lady with a cane and a picket sign, and she looks white because she's now white haired and very light skinned. Um, but she, everybody knew she was a power woman. You probably recognize or know Mary McLeod Bethune, Bethune Bookman Co Cookman College. She and Eleanor became social friends and political friends in the 20s, and then Eleanor recruits her into the New Deal. She is the highest ranking black person in the New Deal. She is the head of the Black Brain Trust. Many of the men whom Roosevelt then recruited would end up being judges or cabinet secretaries in future administrations. Mrs. Roosevelt would walk to the White House gates to greet her because she wanted to be photographed welcoming a black woman into the White House, and she was worried that the white guards would be rude. Um, 
Mrs. Bethune is the only black American to attend the founding meeting of the United Nations as Mrs. Roosevelt's guest. Polly Murray is another Eleanor Roosevelt recruit. She, there's a fabulous book, The Firebrand and the First Lady. Um, she was a college graduate, uh, a lawyer with several degrees. She wrote an enormously significant book about civil rights law that Thurgood Marshall would use in the Brown case. Uh, she would become a Yale Law professor, an Episcopal priest, a published poet. Whenever there was a Supreme Court vacancy, she wrote the president a letter and said, here I am. But she was likely a trans woman, and while she never identified herself as that, everybody suspected it, um, and so she was discriminated against in that way. Constance Baker Motley was the first woman hired by Thurgood Marshall as he led the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And you know that Marshall's the person who came up with this idea that rather than argue that segregated schools ought to have the same resources and their teachers ought to be paid the same, sort of going the separate but equal Plessy argument, he said, no, no, we're just getting rid of segregation. So incrementally, case by case, that was what he was trying to do. Constance Baker Motley would write the brief for Brown, and then she's the woman who really leads the um, desegregation of Southern State Universities. She walked Charlene Hunter Galt into the University of Georgia, um, James Meredith into the University of Mississippi, you name a Southern University, and she has sued them and won. She will end up um, being appointed to a federal um, court by Lyndon Johnson, and she will mentor Sonia Sotomayor. This is one of my favorite stories. I knew nothing about Septima Clark. Septima Clark um, taught in the Charleston, South Carolina segregated school system for 40 years, where she was underpaid and taught in the least resource schools and was teaching kids in the daytime and parents at night. And all this time, um, she's getting madder and madder, so she invites the NAACP to sue the Charleston School Board and the state of Car South Carolina for equal pay for teachers, no matter what school they serve in. This is 1955. She's fired. The state passes a law that you can't belong to the NAACP if you're a public servant. And they take away her pension, 40 years of pension. So she moved to Tennessee to teach at a place called Highlander, which some of you students might recognize was a labor organizing summer school from the 1930s. It's at Highlander where the idea of singing as part of protest to build courage and to build community, and it's where We Shall Overcome was converted from a hymn into a protest song for the, initially for the labor movement in 1946 and then um, uh, the black um, civil rights movement. Um, Septima Clark is teaching there in 1955, and among her students is Rosa Parks. There's a connection here. She will eventually, state of Tennessee will shut Highlander down as a communist front. She gets hired by Martin Luther King to lead the Freedom Summers, and she will, be, she will teach the young people who are teaching voter registration and education and getting lots of people voting. She's credited with 70,000 registered voters in the South um, throughout the 70s. So she retires. She moves back to Charleston. She runs for the school board. She wins, and a Republican governor passes a bill to reinstitute her salary. So it's about the only good story um, among all these women. Um, Rosa Parks goes to Highlander in July of 1955. Emmett Till is murdered and tortured in August of 1955. Rosa is thinking about Emmett Till when she's deciding not to change her seat on the bus. These three women are sort of icons of the 1950s. Ella Baker um, was in New York sending Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Improvement Association money during the 318 days of the bus boycott. Um, and then he hires her when, when so, so he was ready, so they win the bus boycott. Um, and um, Martin Luther King says, good, we're done, I can just be a pastor of my church. And his church ladies say, are you kidding? We have supported you all this time, we put you forward to represent us and you're gonna quit? No, no, you're going bigger. So they um, really forced him out of Montgomery to go um, form the Southern Christian Leadership Conference at his father's church at Ebenezer in um, Atlanta. And he hires Ella Baker, who's been sending money, and she comes down to become his um, chief of staff. And um, she hates that he's telling him what to do, and she's always right. 
so he will disrespect her and fire her. The final straw was in 1960, when the Freedom Riders and the sit-ins are starting. She invites these young black leaders, John Lewis, Stokely Carmichael, Marion Barry, um, Marion Wright Edelman, Marion Wright then, um, Daisy, Daisy Nash, to come to Shaw University in um, Raleigh, and she says, you know, make your own group. Do not be an auxiliary to those ministers. You can be servant leaders, you don't need the ministers. And that made the ministers really mad, so they fire her. Um, and Stokely Carmichael says, Ms. Baker, Ms. Baker was always the brains of the operation. Daisy Bates is the matriarch of the Little Rock Nine, taking them to and from school every day, and while crosses are burned and rocks are thrown at her home, and Diane Nash, Diane Nash, as I said, an early member of SNCC, but she is, um, she's a student at Fisk in Nashville when the first Freedom Ride, which was intended to go from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans, gets through Georgia, gets to Anniston, Alabama, which is just across the Georgia line, and the white sheriff strategies was to let them pull into Greyhound bus stops and be beat up by the hoodlum crowd and not get any health care, and then either arrest them or put them on the bus, bedraggled, and let them drive out of town. They let them drive out of Anniston because as soon as they got outside the city limits, they firebombed the bus, and as people are escaping the bus, they shoot the people on the bus. So the Freedom Ride has ended in Anniston, Alabama. The last thing President Obama did um, before um, his term was up was turn Anniston, Alabama into a national park, civil rights park. Um, but Diane Nash says, wait a minute, we're not stopping, we're just getting more volunteers. So she hires more buses and she fills them with volunteers and she copies Alice Paul. Remember the hunger strikes? Alice Paul's theory was fill the jails. So Diane Nash and the Freedom Riders are filling the jails. They fill every jail across the South and when the jails are full, the Southern sheriffs put them in the state penitentiaries, the work farms, where they sang. Um, I hope you recognize these two women, Fannie Lou Hamer and United Blackwell, testified at the 1964 Democratic Convention protesting an all-white Mississippi delegation when they represented a mixed race, a, a, an integrated um, delegation. They lost that credentials fight. Um, United Blackwell become the first woman elected in the state of Mississippi. She'll become a mayor. But Fannie Lou Hamer is the one who's really heroic here. She was the youngest of 20 children of a sharecropper. She taught herself to read and write. At age 13, she underwent what was known as a Mississippi appendectomy, which is an involuntary hysterectomy. She was beaten every time she was jailed, and she prevailed. And on account of all these women, and lots of black women whose names we'll never know who left home with their toothbrushes and toilet paper in their purses because they were going to end up in some lousy jail. We end up with the Civil Rights Act and then the Voting Rights Act. Um, and you'll note how few women are actually in that picture. So for a very brief time, between the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, there's sort of a period where legislative, I mean, huge legislative successes. Uh, uh, Goals have been achieved. It is now illegal to do the thing. It gets rid of Jim Crow. It gets rid of um, discrimination against voting for a while until some of the protections are removed. So while black women are being heroic, white women are having babies. Um, white women had, uh, white and black women both, had been very active in the Second World War. Some had served in the military where they were allowed despite discrimination, and many of them had moved into the, um, the war work. They, the rosies were of all colors, although you rarely saw photographs of black rosies at the time, but you can find them now. Um, and working, in, working during the Second World War was a huge promotion for women. They got equal pay, they got childcare for the length of the war, and then they're laid off so veterans can come back. Um, but according to the United States Department of Labor, Women have never dropped out of the workforce. Where they were in 1946 is the starting point, and they have only increased. So two drivers of women's independence and agency, 19th century access to education, which expands, and mid-20th mid century access to more employment, which expands. Women who have education and some income 
have more personal agency. If they're married, they can say, I want a wash machine. You might want a boat, but I'm earning money too. We're getting a wash machine. So it changes some of the balance, and it will have impact on society as a whole. So also, these white women are not ninnies. They're paying attention to what's going on in the news, and not unlike the women's movement of the 19th century coming out of the 1830s abolition movement, the women's movement of the 20th century will come out of the civil rights movement. So you have civil rights protest, you have anti-war protest, and then you'll have women protest. They're all learning how to march again. Um, this represents the 1960s. So women in Congress in 1965, this is a high point. This is the most women we'd had in Congress, and this is too few to even have a women's caucus. Well, they took the picture because the fourth person in the back row is Patsy Mink, who's the first woman of color in the Congress. She's um, Asian from Hawaii. In the front row, lower right, is Margaret Chase Smith. If you don't know who she is, you must Google the Declaration of Conscience speech. She's a Republican who takes on Joe McCarthy. We need more Republicans willing to take on Joe McCarthy wannabes. Um, and Martha Griffiths, the second in the, in the back row. Martha Griffiths is the next Carrie Chapman cat. She's the woman who gets sex into Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. She's the woman who will get the Equal Rights Amendment through Congress. Where it had been held captive in the Judiciary Committee since 1943 by a very liberal Democrat who had an ill daughter and did not think, who thought women were fragile and so should not have equal rights. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment sort of was a focal point of the women's movement, that all these things were gonna change and a lot of things did. Um, in the 60s and 70s, the Congress is passing legislation. Um, I mean, I imagine all of you young women here have credit cards in your own name. My first credit card said Mrs. John Deerdorf. Uh, you couldn't get a credit card if you didn't have a husband signing for it. And if you were divorced or single, um, you couldn't rent a house. You, couldn't, you were a credit risk. Um, credit bill was enormous. Title IX, huge social change in America by allowing young women to engage in sports and be treated equally in educational institutions. There's a whole series of these. I, I sort of did you, gave you a highlight list. And at the same time, the Supreme Court is, passing, is, is handing down good decisions. I imagine some of you have been called for jury duty. You're usually registered to um, serve on a jury when you register to vote, some, in some states when you get your driver's license. That was not true before 1972. Um, if you wanted to, because serving on a jury, women might hear things that were shocking or inappropriate. And we did not wish these fragile women to be exposed to the horrors of the world. So if you wanted to serve on a jury, you had to go to your local courthouse and sign up. But that didn't mean that you would then actually be called so women could be tried. This, the, case that, the case that changed this was a woman who'd killed her husband with a baseball bat because he'd been beating her up. And um, it was an all-male jury, and so she was charged. I mean, she might have been charged by a co-ed jury, too, but she was um, charged with manslaughter. Um, and she claimed that it wasn't, it wasn't a jury of her peers. So that began, that began the argument. Many of these cases were brought by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who had unable to get a job as a lawyer with her high academic credentials, had taught briefly at um, Rutgers and then Columbia, the first woman on both of those faculties. And then she's hired at the ACLU to run the Women's Project, and she's bringing all these cases to the Supreme Court, these cases that will make incremental change, um, which, were, which was the way to do it at that time. And then comes Roe. Roe was unexpected. Um, Abortion had been legal in America into the middle of the 19th century. It wasn't called abortion. It was called um, restoring menstrual flow, removing blockages. And then around 1857 into the 1860s, the American Medical Association decides to make a push to make abortion legal. By 1900, it's illegal everywhere. And their argument was, was that white native women, which meant non-immigrant women, um, should be having more babies. And if they didn't have more babies, there would be race replacement by Irish women or German women or people who didn't immediately speak English. The Catholic Church has the same attitude that abortion is legal until insolment, which was the 24th week. 
um, and then they changed their position in 1872. Um, so there were quite repressive abortion laws everywhere, which is why Margaret Sanger starts the birth control movement, because women who had no access to ending an unwanted pregnancy were self-inducing and lots of women were dying. But birth control was also not necessarily a popular cause. But in the 1950s and 60s, the American Medical Association has changed its point of view. Because these doctors can think generally that abortion might not be a good thing, but when the patients in their care don't wish to have the sixth child or are ill or there's a crisis of some kind, they wish to have a little more flexibility. So the American Medical Association, the American Bar Association begin to think about how they can rewrite the laws. But only two or three states have rewritten the laws when the Texas case comes up. People were sort of surprised that it had come up, that the court had taken it, that the court passed it, seven to two. Um, but with the Supreme Court decision, there's really no way, they can't figure out how to oppose it. So opposition to abortion from social conservatives grows through the 1970s. But it's evident because the Equal Rights Amendment passed in March of 1972 is ratified by 21 states almost immediately. And then January 1973 comes in the Roe decision and it starts dribbling off because Phyllis Schlafly arrives. Phyllis Schlafly is a conservative Catholic and an anti-communist. She's brilliant. She has got the same skills as Carrie Chapman Catt as a strategist. And she does two things. She stops the Equal Rights Amendment in its tracks. And she creates a national coalition of people who are angry. She attracts housewives who felt disrespected by the women's movement. She attracts the parents of long-haired boys burning draft cards and women, brawless women marching in the street and seeming disrespectful, having free sex. Their parents were alarmed by that. She attracts evangelical Christians and conservative Catholics opposed to abortion and birth control. She attracts Southern segregationists who are still mad about the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act. So she takes a lot of people who might have previously been Democrats or maybe Republicans, but a lot of Democrats, and she realigns the political parties under a family values banner. And then she hands her family banner, her family values banner to Ronald Reagan. She realigns the political parties in America, and the legacy of that is with us still. Most of you in this room, many of you in this room, are too young to remember when political parties actually had liberals and um, middle of the road people and conservatives, and that's how things got done, because the liberals and the middle people would create bipartisan coalitions and pass stuff. More Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Act than Democrats. Things were different then, but now you have the realignment. Phyllis Schlafly um, basically gives all those voters to Ronald Reagan, who wins. Um, and uh, the Republican Party passes a platform that gets rid of the Equal Rights Amendment. They create a litmus test for judges. Um, things reverse pretty quickly. Uh, despite Sandra Day O'Connor, um, who was a moderate, and Sandra Day O'Connor uh, was a deal, actually. When the Republicans took the Equal Rights Amendment out of their platform in 1980, Republican Congresswomen went to Reagan and said, we're gonna bring an embarrassing floor fight. We will lose, but it will embarrass you if you don't promise to give a Supreme Court seat to a woman. And, and O'Connor jumps the line ahead of um, Robert Bork. So Connors on the court. And conservatives in the Congress and on the court from 1980 on, you can track it, um, end up confining women's roles. It's sort of things are nibbled and nibbled and nibbled and um, rights are reduced. And then leaping ahead, we come to the Dobbs decision, um, which is sort of a result of how the court has become um, so much more conservative. When Justice Alito um, read his majority opinion, he referred to American history 67 times. His key thesis statement was that abortion is not deeply rooted in our nation's history. Abortion is deeply rooted in the history of civilization. As long as men have gotten women pregnant and some women didn't want to carry those pregnancies to term, there have been ways to change, um, to end abortions. 67 references, they are all factually incorrect. 
Um, and this decision has changed the course of women's progress. Because you can have a lot of things. You can have electoral office and access to education and professions and sports and the military. You could have made a lot of progress in the 100 years since suffrage passed, but when women don't have personal autonomy, they have um, less independence than they might imagine, as Justice Ginsburg pointed out. She is being treated as less than a full adult human responsible for her own choices. So I wrote about 100 years of history. And um, I got to the epilogue. It's pretty depressing, because there's lots of good stuff that happened. And again, these young, these young people, um, as I said, they wanted a happier ending. So we added a little bit more. Um, and it's undeniable that American women have made enormous progress. We're not where we were in the 1920s. We have legal rights. We have authority. We have agency over most things. Not as fully as you might think if you look at some of the statistics. But we've made a lot of progress. But there are still issues. The pay, the undervalued roles, maternal mortality is scary, violence against women, the no right to abortion, the not having that the majority of the Congress does not think that child care is an infrastructure issue, that they don't understand American families. We have not made that much progress. 11 women were in the Congress in 1920. There are now 124 women in the Congress. That's 26%. So that's 100 years and 26%. We are 25% of the Senate. The highest number of women in elected office in America is 47%, and that is at the lowest level. That is school boards and city councils, which are really important places to be at the moment. But they are the lowest paid. Um, and women seek those offices because they don't have to move and the campaigns are not expensive. They don't have to change their kids' schools. When I started working in 1970 in the women's movement, women were 3% of state legislatures. They are now 33% of state legislatures. So that's a leap, but that's not a lot. In the history of America, there have been 45 women governors. The first five were basically appointed to fill seats. Today, there are 12, highest number we've ever had serving at once, eight Democrats, four Republicans. And those are women from whom we might draw a presidential candidate, or not, depending where we are. Um, so we've, we've made a lot of progress, but the lesson is, as Dobbs taught us so bleakly, that you can't quit. So we will remember our four mothers, Anthony and Kat. I especially value Coretta Scott King. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it with every generation. I think we thought we'd won. And I frankly don't think we'd won, because I think privileged women had won. I don't think the benefits that privileged women had had trickled down to anybody. I think the majority of women in America were still struggling economically, educationally, with childcare, all the kinds of things, with health care, all those issues. We hadn't even reached everybody yet, and now we've had this pushback but maybe it will energize us. So we have to keep fighting, and we have to keep voting. Thank you. wish to record my gems of wisdom. So the question was about um, what did black women, how did black women organize? 
black women continued to have this broader agenda. There was briefly a black feminist organization that sort of fizzled, um, but they have always been able to create broader agendas than white women. And I think because the issues were so much bigger, there was sort of less competition for credit. It was just to save the beloved community. Um, and so there are national organizations. A lot of it has to do with poverty programs or educational programs or voter registration programs. Um, none get as the attention they deserve or the funding they deserve. I think um, one of the reasons I'm realistically optimistic or optimistically realistic, can't figure out which it is, about the present moment, it partly has to do with young people. I think young people live in a much more diverse world than their parents, so they have the possibility of creating a lot of alliances that we seemed less capable of doing. And I think they've been energized by issues of gun violence and climate control, and I hope they'll be energized by reproductive rights. Um, and I think, I actually think gun control might be one that brings the country together too, um, because it certainly affects every family who are, who are victims of it. Um, so there, there are possibilities for being allies. And I think it's particularly important to be an ally. You may still have your cause, but you can find a way to support somebody else's cause. It doesn't have to be either or, because this country, I think America is the greatest country in the world, and I think our democracy needs to be protected and advanced and enhanced, and we ought not to be afraid of a flawed, messy history. We should learn from that history, which is why everybody should, of course, take history, be a history major, all those things, um, because knowing your history helps you to understand where, we're, where we came from and where we're going and what the roots of the conflict were. So maybe you can do it differently as you advance because we remain the best hope of the world. Um, and there are people dying in Ukraine to protect what we have. So we need to take our roles as citizens seriously. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, another question. Yes, please, more questions. We'll go boy, girl. So was there one over here? Ted, did you have a question? Well, a legal question, perhaps, but there was a big push more recently to reactivate the Equal Rights Amendment after Dobbs' decision came through and the momentum switched. Could ERA be a way to solve the problem brought by the Dobbs' decision? No. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment is dead. Uh, it sort of hurts me to say that because I worked for it for a really long time. Um, but when the Equal Rights Amendment was in, introduced by Alice Paul and then reintroduced throughout, it was actually introduced in every Congress until it finally passes in 68, 70, 72, gets through the Judicial Committee. Its idea was that there were so many discriminatory laws in America against women, somebody counted up 7,000, that if you had a blanket constitutional amendment, you would clean up all those laws. So the Equal Rights Amendment loses, but even the states that voted it down cleaned up their statute books. You cannot actually find, it's really hard, I can't even, I can't think of a state that has a discriminatory law against women. I mean, it used to be things like girls couldn't have newspaper routes and girls couldn't own bars and girls couldn't drink at the same age as boys. I mean, it was relatively dumb stuff, but it had been historically fit in. The, pro the property laws lingered a long time. Um, So it's harder to make the case just on the basis of immediate need. So then it's a constitutional case. Do we need a hook in the Constitution for equal rights? And you could say, sure, if it would pass, it would be good to have it. It's not going to pass. And you've got the language in the 14th Amendment. You've got the Equal Protection Clause. You could have always used the Equal Protection Clause, but the courts chose not to use it for issues of gender. Um, and the case that was made to pass it more recently that it was still active, that it hadn't actually expired and died on June 30th, 1982, is a false case. It did die. And the Democrats, the next January, immediately reintroduced it. So if you've been reintroducing the Equal Rights Amendment at the beginning of every new congressional session since 1983, 84, then does that not suggest that it had died 
and the one that you're now trying to add three more states to is still in effect. And you cannot, I mean, all of the precedent is you can't, that amendments have to be passed within a certain period of time. Prohibition passed in 12 months, um, 19th Amendment passes in 15 months. It has to be relevant to the time. It can't be this big a gap. Um, so I think it's dead. And it couldn't pass now because 30 of the state legislatures are controlled by Republicans. The Congress has no bipartisan support for it. It, would, it cannot pass. It cannot get two-thirds of the Congress or three-quarters of the state. So it's dead. Um, and it would be a tricky issue about whether it applied. In July of 19... 20, Neil Gorsuch, Trump appointee, in a case that I think is Bostitch versus Georgia, I think the guy's name was Bostitch, gay guy, loses his job because he's played on a gay baseball team. And Gorsuch um, says that that's not fair, that's discrimination against him, and he roots it on Title VII of the Equal Protection Act that had sex in it that you can't discriminate on a kind of sex in employment. And he's interpreting sex as LGBTQ. And then he immediately says, but this means nothing about bathrooms or sports teams, but he gives Bostitch that right. Um, so there may be ways of using Title VII if they chose to, but this court's not gonna choose to do that. That, um, is it, it's not Chloe, it's Courtney. Courtney, thank you. What was your favorite part of the Oh my gosh, I loved it all. Um, <laughs> I, so I've been teaching this for a long time, so I knew a lot of it. Um, but to, to sort of re-meet these people, I think I'm really in awe of these brave black women. Part of my research was I took myself on a road trip through civil rights, um, historic sites in the South, um, Greensboro, Atlanta, all through, all through North Carolina, Atlanta, Anniston, Selma, Montgomery, Birmingham. Money, Mississippi, oh my God. Um, I ended up in Memphis, the most depressing road trip I've ever taken in my life. Every place I stopped, somebody had been tortured. Those guys sitting in at the Woolworths counter, you know, they weren't just sitting in, they were being pummeled by white thugs who were putting cigarettes out in their skin, who were breaking um, sugar containers over their head, who were putting salt in the burns. I mean, these people, and then they did not move. They did not give up their stools. Every place you looked, white Americans had tortured black Americans. So it's amazing we have a country that's still holding together at all. But I think that's a reason, and I don't, you know, I'm not for making little kids feel bad because somebody's relatives enslaved somebody else's relatives. That's a historic fact. It happened. We need to put it into the narrative and talk about it. But it also means that by, if we are conscious of that history, then I hope it motivates people to not allow ourselves to repeat it and to find ways to be allies. Over here. Um, that's too big a question for me, I think. Um, I mean, people are, one of the things you learn when you study any kind of American history, but especially if you're looking at it from a point of view which is not the typical majority, which means white male point of view, is to understand the diversity of our country and the diversity of points of view. Women are not a monolithic group. Women are different by class, education, employment, race, gender, maternity, um, whether they've been married or not, uh, their political experience, their geography, their religion. There are so many things that make each individual individual. So people are gonna vote different ways. I do think that on the whole, men and women, until very recently, have had different life experiences. That was, you could see that when women were first elected to the Congress, that they took on different issues. Um, then, um, you know, there didn't used to be any research about women's health, women's heart health care. 
all of the people in the um, research being funded were men, because nobody thought to write the legislation that said we should have 50% men and 50% women and different races included in the research so we could learn how lives are different and how treatment needs to be different. So I think the more people you include changes the conversation and changes the outcome. I, b I really believe that sincerely. That's why I believe in collaborative conversations and decision making and opening rooms to more voices because I think you come out with a different, I'm sure you've all seen that in your lives. If you only have one kind of person in a room, you only get one kind of outcome. But you know, what was it? 53% of white women voted for Trump. Um, and people had reasons for doing that. And it's incumbent if we don't want them to vote for Trump to learn why that was. So there's, people make different choices based on different life experiences. And I keep thinking if you taught the right history curriculum, they would all be making the right decision. But you know, dreamscape of mine. Um, I don't think I answered your question at all. Class is, class is, a, big, class is a big factor in America. Privilege is a big factor. And people who resist the idea of institutional racism need to think about the institutional racism in banking that did redlining and the institutional racism of segregated state universities that kept black veterans from being able to benefit from the GI Bill. There's reasons that there's some economic differences in this country that had to do with white decisions based on race. Okay, last question. Anybody who hasn't already asked a question, but yes, please, I'm eager for questions. Well, um, maybe, maybe you'll decide that that's something to spend your energies on, but at the moment I'd rather you spend it on um, reproductive rights or climate control or guns. I think those are more urgent than the Equal Rights Amendment. And you don't want to fight a fight that you're not going to win. You could all move to North Dakota or Nebraska or some place where you're going to change the voting registration base so that state legislatures are not passing restrictive voting rights acts. Um, we have, a, we have a geographical division in this country which is getting worse. It's almost like it's actually quite parallel to 1920 when half the country was rural and without electricity and half the country was urban and going to speakeasies. And um, people vote differently under those circumstances. Yes, please. I can't hear you. Okay, stand up and say it. Economically, like black people and white people will like be on the same path economically. Like they'll make the same, I guess. Well, I mean, clearly, um, already today, you have many um, affluent African Americans um, um, making lots of changes, uh, and and just by moving into suburbs, moving into boardrooms, you know, their presence in the Congress, lots of places that that changes, and that changes people's perception. But I don't think it's wide enough or deep enough. And I don't, and it's, I mean, there's clearly a privileged class in America who have benefited from education and inherited wealth and talent who've earned their way up, whites and blacks both, immigrants, many very successful immigrants. But we all need to, I think there's a responsibility of the privileged to pay attention to the people who were left behind, who also fall into all of those categories. I think that there's lots of talent in the world and we need to take, and we need it. We need to take advantage of it and need it. Um, this whole fight about immigration is nuts because we do not have enough workers to be doing the jobs the country needs. Um, so I hope all of the young people in the room um, will be supported by the older people in the room um, in, in continuing to pursue whatever cause it is. But I hope it's a cause, and I think I hope this is sustained by the mission of Lewis University that's to make the world better that's to use um, your faith and your education to make a change in the world. Thanks so much. <laughs>